while other campers are working very hard to get out on their own. A storm hit northeastern Minnesota over the holiday weekend. It took out millions of trees, which ruined campsites and ruined many vacations. Channel 5's Bob McNaney joins us live right along the waterfront with stories from people who were there. Bob? Yeah, it's been an incredible day up here, Mike. Now, what we did today is we went north and east of this location at the edge of the Boundary Waters to one of the hardest hit areas. We went out with an outfitter on an area that was only accessible by boat. It's some of the worst hit areas that you can imagine. But even here in a cove where things are protected, you can see that the wind was strong enough to snap off even the tops of the, the biggest pine trees. Along the way today, we caught up with some kids who tonight are leaving the Boundary Waters literally bruised and broken. I was scared. I, I thought I was going to die. It's the first thing that went through my mind. Honestly, we all thought we were going to die. <laughs> we're not very religious, but we all started praying real quick. Tony Stahl and the other three boys did survive the storm, but just barely. A 60-foot tree crushed the tent the boys were in. Tony's ankle is badly injured. Tyler Steerwald's collarbone is broken, and he's badly bruised. They'll never be the same. Mm -mm. I'll remember this for the rest of my life. The scouts were taking shelter with nothing more than their tents to protect them on a small island. The trees came crashing down. Pete Esposito, the leader of this group, amazingly pulled that 60-foot tall pine off the boy's tent by himself. Not in my wildest dreams could I have lifted it up uh, in a regular state of mind. I was thinking about the guys. Uh, at that point, I already thought a couple of them were dead. So. I wanted the other guys to get out of there. The power of the storm, which ripped through the boundary waters, is unmatched in recent years. However, the power of prayer, says the boys tonight, proved even stronger than the winds, which nearly killed them. I ripped my crucifix off my chest, and I started praying, screaming out loud as hard as I could, uh, just hoping it would end. But um, it did, and the good Lord showed us the strength, and we just had to sit back and take it. There wasn't much else they could do. Coming up at 6, we'll tell you how long it has taken some people who are just coming ashore tonight to get out of the Boundary Waters since the storm hit. Mike? Those scouts probably earned a few extra badges from this experience. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right, Bob, thanks a lot. The forestry, uh, the forestry Department estimates the storm destroyed as many as 12 and a half million trees. Now, just to put things into perspective, last summer in the entire metro area, storms uprooted only about 47,000 trees. Many campers sat helplessly as those trees fell all around them. That's a case for a Roseville couple. They were on Trout Lake when the storm hit. Tonight, they are back home, and Channel 5's Rod Rassman talked with them. Rod? Well, Julie, David and Susan Murphy have been vacationing in Boundary Waters a number of times, about a half dozen times, as a matter of fact. They say it's a great place to get away and get rid of some stress. A little did they know they were going to come away with more stress than they went into the vacation with. It was just one of those days where you knew it was going to let loose. And let loose it did. There was no warning. Just the clouds came in, the water was calm like, like glass, and it was just like let loose all at one time. When the wind picked up, David and Susan Murphy heard trees coming down, so they left their tent and hid by some boulders. As you can see by this picture, that decision may have saved their lives. We saw the one come down and actually crush the tent. It went right down, right down the middle of the tent. The tree came down this way and landed on the canoe and, and rolled off. The storm ruined both their canoe, which now has cracks in it. Here's the, here's the top part of the tent. Came through and, and their the top tent, part of the tent, which has huge holes and, in it. It was a very bizarre, very bizarre storm. Luckily, this so all happened the day before the Murphys were going to leave. We just decided that was it. We just packed up and went into the casino and stayed there that night. We're the last yeah, good thinking. There, right? and if you're lucky enough to get through this unhurt, navigating a blackjack table should be no problem. You know, somebody obviously was looking out for us. We were pretty lucky. I asked the Murphys if they plan to go back again next year. David said that he'd be there right now if he had more time off. Susan, on the other hand, is thinking maybe a resort vacation is starting to look pretty good for next year. Well, I certainly wouldn't blame her. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Rod. Well, most of the a mail are still trapped, waiting for the trails to be cleared. The storm tore a path through northern Minnesota, 12 miles wide and 30 miles long, starting near Ely and ending along the Gunflint Trail. The view from the air is amazing. An estimated 12 and a half million trees were damaged or destroyed in the storm. 
35 people were injured. And now the Forest Service is breaking its own rules, bringing in chainsaws to clear portages and allow people safe passage out. We have a team report on the Northwood storm recovery. Care 11's Phil Johnston talked to a Minneapolis woman whose legs were broken in the boundary waters by a falling tree. But first, Dennis Stauffer is live on the Gunflint Trail with the beginning of a long cleanup. Yeah, Frank, the Forest Service folks aren't the only ones wielding chainsaws and not just inside the boundary waters. Here at the Golden Eagle Lodge along the Gunflint Trail, they've been feeding this burn pile for days already and they'll be at it for days yet to come. Cutting, dragging, and burning. It's a massive task. I'm trying to get all the roads opened up so at least we can move around here. They've only had time to patch the 17 of 26 buildings here that were damaged, some beyond repair. No power, no sewer, no electric. About half the resorts that line the Gunflint Trail are closed. This is the main portal to the eastern BWCAW, a portal nature suddenly closed. You shut down. Despite all the damage here at the Golden Eagle Lodge, no one was hurt. Although the three kids who called this home were shaken. The kids were just really scared. Yeah, they're still not sleeping in their own room. <laughs> For Dan and Teresa Bauman, the wilderness is both home and business. So living with uncertainty is part of the package. Even when it means sacrificing the three new picnic tables built just last Thursday. This is still a natural thing of trees falling. And One family decided to stay here throughout it all, even with the lack of utilities. The hope is to be able to reopen with utilities by this weekend. Frank and Pat. All right, thanks, Dennis. We continue our team report now with Care 11's Phil Johnston. That's right. He has the story of one Twin Cities woman's survival. She waited to be rescued while she was pinned under a tree. Well, Pat and Frank, the more we learn about this weekend storm, the more frightening stories of survival we hear. But few could possibly be as harrowing as the story Christine McConnell can now tell from a Duluth hospital bed. You're you're totally isolated. I mean, you're completely alone. It is for that reason Christine McConnell and her fiance Chris McLaren loved to vacation in the Boundary Waters. And I was just praying, praying that somebody would be there. But on Sunday, the final day of a four-day canoe trip, that isolation would almost cost Christine her life. And the minute we started to experience lightning in the area, you know, I knew we needed to get our canoe off the off the river. And Chris, said, well, there's a spot right there. Is a big tree and thought, isn't this kind of romantic? We were under this gigantic tree and it's raining a little bit and we're almost done with our trip and we had a good trip. And the next thing I knew, I looked down and this huge tree that, you know, that was this wide had fallen down like this. And so my legs were trapped like this. Chris tried so for like 10 minutes, but there was no chance yeah, one person could move right. the massive tree. At some point, it came to a point where you just make an arbitrary decision and say, it's time to go. When my head was down on this log, I was just like, just wincing in pain. He's like, look at me, please look up. And he made me look up and say, I love you back. Fighting the clock and the fierce storm, Chris paddled downstream to the entry point where the car was left. Them. You know, I couldn't feel my legs. But 19 I miles thought, from the nearest town, finding help would be a miracle. They were the exact people we need. They were the angels. Salvation came in the form of a family of six. And they had a cell phone, and there were two able-bodied men there, and uh, lots of people to help us. This went on for 35 minutes, and finally I, I heard someone say hello. For 45 minutes, the three men dug back. a hole under Christine's so guess, legs, you know, until finally. And I just grabbed this leg, and I just yanked it as hard as I could down, and it came free. And the story doesn't end there with all of the downed trees. It took an ambulance hours to reach Christine. In fact, it was six and a half hours before she got any pain medication. After all that, Christine ended up with two broken legs. She's expected to recover completely. Frank and Pat? Well, that's the good news. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, okay. Phil. In other news this evening, the official search for Katie Poya resumes tomorrow. A pickup truck and a car before rear ending the other bus in a tunnel. 20 of the injured students and chaperones from Winona Cotter High School were taken to the hospital. None of their injuries, though, were serious. Police ticketed the bus driver for reckless driving. Authorities are investigating a drowning at Bush Lake Beach in Bloomington today. Rescue crews were called to the scene around 1130 this afternoon when an 18-year-old man went underwater and then disappeared. During the incident, uh, with the help of the witness statements, we were able to pinpoint a, a location 
where the victim was found by Bloomington fire divers. Authorities question lifeguards and other witnesses at the beach. The victim's identity has not yet been released. A Ramsey County Sheriff's deputy is charged with sexual misconduct tonight for alleged... Water proves to be tougher than even the hardiest of campers. Tonight, many of them are sharing their stories. Good evening, I'm Julie Nelson. Thanks for joining us. Air crews spent their second straight day looking for injured campers among acres of downed trees. They also started dropping ground crews into the Boundary Waters canoe area along the state's northern border. They're using saws to clear portages and campsites buried after a weekend storm. So far, they have airlifted 20 injured people out of the BWCA. One of them is in critical condition. They spotted many campers today, but no one they found today was hurt. The DNR tells us most of the injuries were twisted ankles and broken bones. The most serious were concussions and a spinal cord injury. The storm left thousands of others rattled. Channel 5's Bob McNaney spent the day talking to many of them, and he joins us live from the Boundary Waters with some of their stories. Bob? Well, their stories are pretty amazing. The people who come up to this beautiful part of the state to relax and forget about the rest of the world. But this storm has definitely had an impact on the people who live and work in this wilderness. They've been shaken by the storm as well. If you're driving on the roads uh, where they're doing power line work. Dave Keeley and Ann Mayo are newlyweds who both work for the Department of Forestry. They're heading back into the wilderness today to help clean up after being caught out in the storm. The sheer power of the wind um, to see trees that are, you know, two foot in diameter just get snapped 10 feet up to live trees is pretty amazing. And then to see one, but then to see a whole wide swath of that is uh, pretty humbling in a lot of ways. Dave and Ann, however, were in separate parts of the Boundary Waters when the storm hit. It was comforting to have the radio and to be hearing what was going on, but it's scary also to hear that the worst of the storm had gone through where he was. Cleaning up will take months. However, life is beginning to get back to normal for many campers who survived nature's worst and who are now enjoying themselves in a world many consider to be nature's best. So obviously the question now is what's open, what isn't, should you come up here, should you stay home, how will this affect the rest of the summer? Those are some of the things that will be addressed at a community meeting in Ely tonight. Julie will be back in Ely this evening and uh, have the latest for you tonight on Eyewitness News at 10. All right, we'll look for you then. Thanks a lot. Bob McNaney reporting for us live. The resounding theme of the campers leaving the Boundary Waters is we're lucky to be alive. That's a case for a couple from Roseville. David and Susan Murphy were near Trout Lake when that storm hit. A tree fell right on top of their tent, as you can see from that picture. It was just minutes after they left the tent to go look for shelter. You know, somebody obviously was looking out for us. We were pretty lucky that, that we were not in there. We would have been hurt pretty bad had we been in there, gotten hit by that. The Murphys have vacationed at Boundary Waters a half dozen times, but after what happened this weekend, Susan's talking about booking a resort vacation instead next year, and you can hardly blame her. The storm rages, raises a lot of questions about the area and the campers that plan to use it this summer. To help answer some of those questions, we've invited DNR Forester Tom Kroll to join us. Mr. Kroll, thanks for being with us. Glad to be here, Julie. Let me start by asking you about the condition of the campsites and how that's going to affect people who have plans, say, for next weekend or even this week. Should they head up there or do they, should they wait a while, do you think? I think people should uh, check it out but plan to head up. There's Most of the wilderness is still open uh, to uh, people who want to come in and enjoy the uh, sights and the scenery. So if you have plans to come up there, anything special you should bring, anything you should expect that would be different from trips past? Well, I think the thing to do is to check in advance with your outfitter, uh, make sure that the outfitter uh, you know, has, has, uh, is expecting you and has got a place for you to go. But what we found is that our outfitters do have places where everybody to go. It might be a slight alteration what you had planned, but they'll uh, find a place for you to enjoy the wilderness. As for the DNR and the other agencies, how are you planning on cleaning this up? I mean, the beauty of it is it's so remote, but I imagine that's going to make it really hard to clean up. Well, it's certainly going to be hard to clean up, and uh, you know, part of the uh, the problem is going to be the massive amount of work that's going to be done. We are clearing portages right now as part of the search and rescue effort to get people out, uh, but there's going to be a lot of other portages that are going to have to be cleaned up later, as well as campsites are going to have to be rehabilitated in order to be put into a really good condition. Now, as you mentioned, it's just an absolutely huge area. Can you tell us, do you have any idea at this point how many trees were downed and what you're going to do to replace them? Well, I think you could conservatively say that maybe 25 million trees were wow. blown down. Uh, Mother Nature will replace them. I mean, they're growing today. A tree may have died, but the, uh, the forest is living and healthy. 
and so that won't be a problem from that. Now, as far as the wild.